anything in my way, I will go through it. And it rubbed people up the wrong way. It did what it did. No player in the history of English cricket has polarised opinion more than Kevin Peterson. I don't think there's many better players who've ever played for England. 50% of the time is fantastic, 50% of the time is a prep. He just knew something was there. This guy is something different. I don't think he would deny the fact that he could occasionally be a bit of a Some of the things he did on the pitch were without peer. He's the only man I've known who's fell in love with himself at 16, but he's been faithful ever since. As a batsman, he was pure box office and arguably the most talented ever to pull on an England shirt. What a shot that is. You just cannot coach this. That really is as good as it gets. My name's Kevin Peterson, and you better believe it. But while no one doubted his ability as a cricketer, he was often deemed unmanageable, and his career was blighted by fallout and controversy. I'd just like to take this opportunity to apologise to my teammates. Do you regret what's happened, Kevin? It's been hard, it's been horrible, it's been hurtful and disappointing. So who is the real KP and what really happened in that England dressing room? You are texting the opposition players or because they're my mates. messaging him. What about loyalty? You know, yeah, but England, there's an IPL, I want to move on. What about a bit of loyalty? No, no. From Moores through to Taylor, Strauss, Pryor, Flower. Where does it end? You, what, at you, some you, stage you not think, it could be me, Kev. I'm on a journey to find out the true Kevin Peterson story. That's it. The arms are aloft. Ball through extra cover signals Kevin Peterson's first Test 100. This could yet be the biggest day of his career. In the 2005 Ashes series, Kevin Peterson scored his maiden test century for England. He would go on to play over 100 test matches, scoring almost 14,000 international runs. I've come to meet him at his lodge in South Africa to find out how a boy from the small town of Peter Maritzburg became an England cricketing legend. How are you, brother? Gone back to your roots here. I know. Hey? How are you? you? Take Africa out of the boy and the boy out of Africa. And <laughs> I know. All that. I know. Hey? Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. This is my um, this is my home yet. Kevin, let's go right back to the beginning. What was it like growing up in Pete Maritzburg all those years ago? I had an amazing childhood. Um, it was the African way. We had um, the most wonderful family life. We've got three brothers. In the summers, we were playing cricket in the back garden. In the winters, we were playing rugby against each other. Do you say your competitive juices came from those early days, playing sport with your brothers? Huge, because um, you know, there were four boys in our family, and I was third in the list. When you played rugby, full contact, you just carry on. You got tackled by your older brother, he hammered you, you hammered him. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that just went into our games. I tell you what, some of my cricket games and rugby games on our front lawn in Peter Maritzburg, were tougher than any international cricket I've played. Like, proper, proper competitive. Grant, you've known Kevin for a number of years. What was he like as a schoolboy? Just a very determined, uh, hard-nosed uh, individual who, who didn't take failure, passionate in whatever he did. Um, besides cricket, he, you know, he played uh, rugby at a, at a high level. Um, squash, you know, obviously in the family with his dad. You know, he was a good squash player as well. Um, we had many a battle, but you know, just a really determined individual, which I think stood him in good stead. So Kev, was this the journey you used to have to make most mornings and evenings to school and back? Yeah, Monday to Friday. Now, so we left Peter Maritzburg when uh, I was 12 years of age. We moved to Westville, just outside Durban, and this is the road that we used to take. How long was the journey? About 50 minutes. It were long, longish days. What's this place here on the right, then? I've got no idea. Oh, there we go, the Harry Guala Stadium. Who was Harry Guala, Kev? Um, um, Drive. Who was Harry Guala? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Maybe we should ask. Madam, who's Harry Guala? <laughs> Maritzburg College was renowned for its sports stars. It yeah. produced the likes of John T. Rhodes, a couple of rugby players, David Miller of late. Yeah. Was sport 
huge part of your upbringing at that school? <laughs> I didn't go there for maths. <laughs> <laughs> what were your sports uh, then? I played everything, but I was a late developer, and I think that's my story. I wasn't very good. I had a little bit of talent. I bowled off spin, and I turned out to be a batsman. So if you've got that hunger, that passion, that desire for a sport like I had for cricket, then I do believe that you, you, you get half a chance. You've got, to, you've got to get opportunities, you've got to take opportunities, and you've also got to be lucky along the way. Cheers, drive. This is Goldstones. The main pitch. Yeah, this is where the big boys play. This is the first team field. This is Hello Turf. When you were your first year, first couple of years at Marisburg College, you're not allowed to walk on here. Was that right? You have to sprint across this field. It was a pretty strict uh, environment. What happened to you if you were just caught walking across there? Well, you'd have to go scoring. running for the prefix. So at every break time, if they wanted something, they'd just call you, Peterson, come here. <laughs> You just walk in there and you can speak to them. Standard attention every time you talk to a prefect. Go and get me a toaster sandwich. And you would literally just pew, put foot, get it, sprint back, then stand back at attention. Go and get me a pencil. And they would just hammer you. And I mean, yeah, you, you say just it was, never did it. You say it was, this was for the big boys. Yeah. How many teams would you have, like, of a weekend? Four or five teams? Or? I mean, you could go up to a J. You could have 10, Seriously? 11, 12 oh. teams. So it is a massive school. And is it a successful or was it a successful Huge when you successful were here? School. Yeah. Hugely so successful. No... I never lost a game of uh, rugby my whole sporting career, like my whole schooling career. We lost a couple of cricket games, but, um, oh, goodness, it brings back such amazing memories. Mike, you're one of KP's first coaches at Maritzburg College. What was he like as a lad growing up? Good traditional background, tough kid, uh, self-belief, uh, rough and ready. A typical South African teenager. Was he well liked at school? Was he a popular lad? Yeah, he wasn't unpopular. Um, I mean, we all know him as, as, a, as, as having been a prickly kind of guy, but certainly a guy who backed himself and got involved in the holistic uh, part of the school, playing rugby and cricket. Your last year at that college, you didn't get into the school first team, did you? No, I only got in in the fourth term of school, so I started only playing kind of representative cricket when I was 17 and a half years of age. The thing is, it's a cool story because not everybody's a superstar in us. Not everybody gets that, uh, that silver spoon and says, you know what, go and carry on. And there's a lot of silver spoons that turn out to be throwaways. And it grew through my, my childhood in Peter Maritzburg. I was completely focused. Having left school, it wasn't long before Peterson had progressed into the Natal first class setup, but still mainly as a spinner. So you were coach here at Natal when a young Kevin Peterson was trying to make his way. What was he like as a player back then? I described him then as a man in a hurry. Uh, from the way he came to nets, buzzing, and uh, just the way he played his cricket, it was all action. You knew he was going to be a first-class cricketer, but you didn't know that he was going to become as fine a player as he became. Why is it then that he was batting at number nine, number eight, and bowling off spin for the Dolphins. Yeah. And yet was such a gun batter, or developing into such a gun batter. I think it, probably the composition of the Dolphin side at the time, it was a, it was a, a really talented unit. Uh, we batted kind of all the way down to number nine, ten. The likes of Sean Pollock was batting nine. You had Lance Klusner batting at eight or nine as well. So it was a really strong batting lineup. So from his perspective, quite difficult to, to force himself in as a batsman. But it wasn't just the strength in depth of Natal's batting that was keeping Peterson out of the first team. Now, just for people who don't know, tell us what the quota system was exactly in South Africa. The first decree was that there would be no all-white team, national team. Then moved down into the provincial system, into the domestic system, um, and it changed. The quota target, as it is described now, was increased so that now it's six non-white players three of whom must be black African. But when Kevin Peterson reacted to it, it was just in its infancy. First time I met Kevin was in 1999 during an England tour match against Natal, where his offspin somehow claimed four wickets. He was, however, already thinking about leaving. I only understood the enormity of the occasion from the front page of one of the papers, we need one hero. And I said, I'll be that hero today. Topping the averages. Playing brilliantly for knots, mm. but your captain picks up your cricket case and throws it over the balcony. Yeah, but that's Why that... does that happen? 
There were stories that he was not the greatest team player, but I didn't care about that. You know, I just wanted someone that could win games for England. That's six. I said to him, are you going to play a shame one? He said, I'm going to smack him. It was a red juke sport, and we needed runs, and I bashed it. That was when everybody in the world took notice of Kevin Peterson. There are certain players that just exist on a different plane altogether. Throughout the whole of his career, Peterson just knows how to produce magic when it matters. By 2005, Peterson's gamble to leave South Africa for England had paid off, and he had announced himself on the international stage in a big way. That's it. He's got his first one-day hundred. That's a great shot. Good strike. Magnificent strike. That's miles over the boundary. That's his hundred. That is some knock. But back in England, there were already signs that he was not going to be the easiest person to manage. Sorry, you were one of the first people in England to see a young Kevin Peterson back in 2000. What did you make of him when you first saw him? When he came across, he was your typical Southern Hemisphere, very tall, very athletic, very confident, some might say, verging on a little bit of arrogance. He batted four for us, averaged 50 odd. He wanted to bowl, he just didn't get the opportunities. His batting was impressive, yeah. Did you find him high maintenance and hard work or not? Yes, there were times when he ruffled feathers. feathers. Other, other people felt that he wasn't always playing for the team. There were times when he would play for himself. And as I said to them, yes, that's the case. But as long as he does his job, I'm happy. But yeah, there were times when it was difficult. After helping Cannock to the Birmingham League title, Peterson's performances attracted the attention of an old mentor. I saw that he was now the leading uh, run-getter in the Birmingham League. And that's when I phoned him up and I said, right, I want you to come and play for me. I'm not even asking you to come on trial because uh, I'll have you playing for England in four years' time. This is the bit that really intrigues me about your career. You left here as a dodgy off-spinner who batted at number nine. Yeah. In the first three seasons for Knotts, you topped the averages every single... As a batsman. As a batsman. What did you do with your know. batting? I don't know. I found it easy to bat in England. Maybe it's just talent or just some sort of a hand-eye gift, which I've never taken for granted. Jason, you first came across Kevin in 2001. He arrived at Knotts. What made his batting kick on the way it did, you think? His hand-eye coordination, he's very tall. He had the ability to hit balls that us mere mortals could just push back. So he had this ability to strike the ball. He wasn't going to let anything stand in his way. He was determined, he was focused. He had a work ethic that was second to none, as good as I've ever seen. So he would hit ball after ball after ball. Not everyone was like that, though. You had a problem with the county cricket mentality yeah. where there was a comfort zone. It did get you into trouble a few times. It did. I didn't like people earning the regular county contract and for six months of the year just getting hammered on a Friday night and playing on a Saturday and not putting in those extra yards of training. That just wasn't me. Because of where I've come from, because of the challenges that I've faced, I believe it is such a wasted opportunity if you're lazy. I, uh, my response to that would be that everybody's trying to get the best out of themselves from what I saw. I, you know, I think some people don't get to a certain level. Kevin's level was moving all the time. Certain people don't move through the levels like Kevin could. And then that was, I can understand why you would think that, but certain people, be it local county players from all over the Shires, don't have the ability that Kevin had to keep moving. With Kevin, a lot of the time, the better he played, the worse he behaved. And I think that started to lead to issues around the dressing room and that people, whilst they could enormously respect his ability, if he was putting other people down at the same time, that made the relationships more difficult. Things were getting tense in here. I think there was an occasion where Chris Cairns held him up against a wall because he refused to go out and field after batting. That was one of the more intense moments I've seen in the cricket dressing room. Two big blokes squaring up is you know, one not taking a backward step, the other not taking a backward step. Yeah, look, I think it, it got to a point where it was no longer manageable um, and things needed to change. 
You're topping the averages, playing brilliantly for knots, mm. but your captain picks up your cricket case and throws it over the balcony. Yeah, but that's Why a, that, does that happen? Yeah, but that happens because it was a Nottinghamshire issue. They sacked Clive Rice. Richard Logan, my best friend, was promised another contract and they never gave him another contract. And I just said to Notts, I'm out of here. Kevin keeps a, a lot of people very close, uh, a small amount of people very close to him. And when two of those guys that were really close to him had gone from the club, he, was, he decided to leave as well. We got to the last game and he basically walked around the changing room and shook everyone's hands and said, right, I'm off, that's it. And I said, but you've got another year's contract to fulfill. And he's sort of like, well, I'm off anyway. We wanted a couple of beers and Kevin's bats were all lined up and one happened to go out the window. There were stories that he was not the greatest team player, but I didn't care about that. You know, I just wanted someone that potentially could win games for, for England. After the South Africa series, Peterson had established himself within the one-day side. He was now ready to prove his worth against England's oldest enemy. I think he showed against the Aussies in that one day series that led into the Ashes. He's just got a gift in a game to be able to put the opposing team under a huge amount of pressure. You got wickets at Bristol, overshadowed slightly by another remarkable innings. We hadn't really seen an England batsman destroy Australian bowlers like that. Fair enough? No, oh, massively. He came out and played unbelievable. That's six. Peterson's gone for the big one. That's sailing into the crowd. Serious words between Peterson and Watson. That was a phenomenal innings, and I think that was when everybody in the world took notice of Kevin Peterson. It's a monster, this one. I remember him smacking Gillespie to all parts. Bigger, bigger, and bigger. And four players Andrew Strauss, Andrew Flintoff, Steve Harmison, and Paul Collingwood actually came and said he's got to play in the Ashes. I said, oh, I think he may just get that nod. Kevin Peterson's the hero for England, 91 not out. England home by three wickets. That one at Bristol was unbelievable. And I remember having a conversation with him, this is honest truth. The conversation went, right, done well in South Africa, done well in the one days, you're going to be playing in the Ashes. He said, yeah. So I said to him, are you going to play Shane Warne? He said, I'm going to smack him. That was the answer. I said, I, so I don't know a minute. What do you mean you're going to smack him? Nobody's done that ever. He goes, when he bowls at me, I'm taking it to him. He might get me out, but I'm not letting him feel comfortable bowling at me. From what I'd seen um, in that one-day series, I thought there was a special level of talent there and ability that you simply couldn't ignore. And also the way that he was playing, which was super aggressive. You know, we had players that could play and we had players that could be really hard to play against, but we didn't have many players that really sent a shiver down the opposing team and Kevin straight away just had that kind of mindset. Your Ashes debut, your debut for England. Did you feel ready for Test Match Cricket? I thought with the hostility of what the Ashes presented, I'd conquered that against South Africa in the One Day Series before, so I wasn't afraid of a battle. It's going to be one of the biggest occasions of my, of my sporting career so far. I wasn't afraid of the Australians. It's just a case of keeping things simple, knowing that it's a game of cricket, and that's what has stood me in good stead. I wasn't afraid of any of the previous history between Australia and England. For me to succeed is to keep things simple and to make sure that I watch the red ball and players I've been playing. I thought that I had what it took to give that a good go. Vaughan had had a lot of success against Australia, so didn't buy into this whole thing that they were better than us. All the, the meetings were about being out, going out, being aggressive, taking the game to them, not taking a backward step, almost standing up to bullies. That was kind of the messaging. And, you know, in a lot of ways, there was no one that embodied that better than KP. Welcome to Lord's Cricket Ground in London for the first day of the first Ashes Test match between England and Australia. What do you feel like that first morning at Lord's? Opening day of Lord's, the crowd at Lord's, the long room at Lord's. I mean, I was just trying to take all this stuff in. They batted first and I think I got 50 or 60 the next day. You say you got 50 or 60. It wasn't the runs you got, it was the way that you got them. That's hit very hard indeed. Can Gillespie get across to cut that off? The answer's no. We played poorly at Lords, the whole team, apart from Kev. You know, he's on debut. You know, we're struggling, and all of a sudden he walks out there and he just looks like he's playing in the park. 
and he toyed with Glenn McGrath. Again, I'd not seen that from an England player. That's a massive hit up in the air. Straight into the members in the pavilion. That's woken a few up. What makes you think I can put Glenn McGrath back over his head into the pavilion? Sea ball, hit ball, that's... That's just whacked it. I know people say it's Glenn McGrath, Glenn McGrath, Glenn McGrath. Well, it wasn't Glenn McGrath. It was a red Dukes ball, and we needed runs, and I bashed it. What is the dressing room thinking? I know what I was thinking. I was gobsmacked. I was 22 yards away. I was at the other end when he did it. McGrath had a brilliant record at Lords. I don't know, he averaged 10 or something, and he used to bowl from that pavilion end, and he'd hit a nagging length, and he would pin people to the crease. And Peterson was kind of taking a massive stride, whereas everybody else with low hands and a low back lift was getting pinned. So it was just that ability that struck me straight away there, and I thought, yeah, this guy's going to be all right. Oh, well, McGrath's not enjoying this. And 50 for Kevin Peterson in his very first Test match innings. It's been quite an innings too. Even though we lost that game pretty badly, it was a good demonstration to all of us that actually, if you do take the game to Australia, they could run out of ideas pretty quickly. Do you understand the reaction, though? Hold on, if Kevin can do this, maybe some of us should have that attitude as well. I know that it was a team effort, and Michael Vaughan and Duncan Fletcher took, took it to us and said, guys, if we're going to go down, let's go down swinging. And the guys did that. Next test match, first morning, Triscothic and Strauss, magnificent. That's the uh, 20th boundary of the morning. Took Australia for a 408 on day one. Well, that's a big blow. Me and Freddie went to town for a session and we had a lot of fun with it. Well, that's outrageous. Well, it could have been uh, Vivian Richards, this. And I think that's been what I've done throughout my career. If I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down my way, um, on and off the field. Twenty-three test hundreds. The most important for an England fan was the one at the Oval. Yeah. I mean, England were desperate to win that Ashes series. It was yeah. the greatest series of all time. That last day at the Oval, tell me what you were thinking, what you were feeling. Did you understand the enormity of the occasion? I only understood the enormity of the occasion from the front page of one of the papers. We need one hero, and I said, I'll be that hero today. The thing that helped me the most in that innings was Vaughan and Bell got out in consecutive balls. Oh, first ball, what a twist in this game. So the enormity of the situation didn't have time to sit with me while I waited to bat. So Vaughan went, Bell went, it was just put your pads on and go. You can sense it, you can taste it, you can smell it, you can feel it. England now 67 for three, McGrath on a hat-trick, new batsman, Kevin Peterson. I heard the massive roar. I thought, oh, he's gone. Can't believe it. Hat trick. And then I looked up at the screen, and Billy Bowden, I think it was, and he went not out, and it come off his shoulder. Shake it ahead. Shake it ahead. It's not out. It's off the body. Great decision. I could have completely understood if the umpire had given it out with the emotions of the day. To watch the way things unfolded on that final day, it's just extraordinary. You know, I still can't quite believe it. It played out the way it did. <laughs> He's nicked it. That's a drop. He's come off the keeper, I think. I was dropped twice. <laughs> Fortune favours the brave on occasions. You've got to take the opportunities. You've got to work hard and be driven, but you've also got to be lucky along the way. The other thing that seemed to help you was lunch, actually, because Brett Lee was just steaming in at you. <sighs> he hit you. I sat at lunch with this ice pack on there, just literally. He just crunched me. It's bowling, what, 96, 97 mile an hour. I got hit so hard. Kev's in the corner and he goes, skip, skip, can I have a word? So after I says, yeah, what's your problem? And his eyes, he, he, he looked petrified. And he goes, I, I don't know how to play it. So I just went, well, how have you played all series? He said, well, I've been aggressive. He said, but the, I said, get out there. So just give us half an hour. Give us half an hour of aggression, take him on. <laughs> in the air that has gone a long way in the air. That's Kevin Peterson's 50th. Valuable runs. I have to admit, the first 10 minutes after lunch, I'm sat on that balcony going, oh my word, what have I said? 
but I think it released him to go out and just play. It's in the air, but it's gone a long, long way again. We're sitting in the balcony going, oh, what's he doing that for? Why is he playing that? Kevin didn't believe in that. Kevin went for it. He was a young player without any fear, without any mental baggage, and wanted to take the game to Australia. And half an hour later, probably 40 minutes, we'd scored 40 or 50 runs. That's it. The arms are aloft. Ball through extra cover signals Kevin Peterson's first Test 100. What a performance. This could yet be the biggest day of his career. I think it just illustrated the incredible ability he had. You know, th there are certain players that just exist on a different plane altogether. To hook Brett Lee for six consistently when he was bowling 95 miles an hour, to be able to smash Shane Warne around when he was turning around corners, you know, those are things that ordinary mortals can't do. Throughout the whole of his career, Peterson just knows how to produce magic when it matters. The Ashes are heading England's way. His utter self-belief was what got him into a position to draw that test match, save that test match, which won us a series. England have regained the ashes at the Oval, September the 12th, 2005. Do you think you'd won the ashes without Peterson that year? I don't think we would. No, I don't think we would. Um, we might have, because we might have caught our catches better, because he dropped six catches, <laughs> and we took the mickey out of him for it. So we might have got the Australians a bit cheaper if Kev could catch it, but, hey, I'd rather have had him in my team scoring the run. College old boy wins the Ashes. I'm guessing there's only one college old boy that's won the Ashes, Kev. <laughs> yeah. What was it like playing in that series? It was amazing. It was the start of a test career which went from strength to strength. Yeah, this shirt was worn with immense pride, and I don't know if it was worn on day five. That's beautiful. The Brett, Lee, the Brett Lee bumper oh, under the ribs, Jesus. the little mark in there, no? They, no. they, they, they has to be. <laughs> um, but it would have been worn through at, at some stage in the series. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it brings back wonderful memories, it does. You win the Ashes, your life changes that moment, yeah. doesn't it? Did you yeah. feel that change in your life? Yeah, I did. Um, it was rabbits and headlights. It was just, I mean, everything changed. But I was always afraid of a few things. I was afraid of the media. But at the age of 25, when, when my life did change, Jesus, I liked those uh, bright lights for a while. It was obviously a very public celebration, open top yeah. bus, etc. But behind the scenes, you get, you get the MBE, and your mum and dad are there. And I've heard your mum and dad talk about it. That was one of the best days of their lives, going to Buckingham Palace, meeting the Queen, etc. It was one of the best days of my life. Yeah. It's truly humbling. It's, I mean, it's breathtaking. Like, to think that I've come from Peter Maritzburg and I walk around and I can chuck an MBE next to my name. It's a case of me making the best decision of my life five or six years, five or six years ago, um, in terms of uh, coming over here to, to, to fulfill my ambition, to fulfill my dream. And, in playing international cricket and being and being one of the, hopefully one of the best uh, players in the world. With the Ashes urn finally back in their hands, England had now stumbled across a seriously talented cricketer. But it wasn't long before problems started mounting. Those text messages that hurt me. Oh! From Moores through to Taylor, Strauss, Pryor, Flower. But at you, some stage you not think it could be me, Kev. I don't think he should have played for England again. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I've talked about it. So there's not much more that I can do on the situation or on the topic. What about loyalty? You know? Yeah, but England, remember. There's an IPL. I want to move on. What about a bit of loyalty? No, no. Oh! Wasn't that good at captaincy, <laughs> was it? <laughs> the fact that Peter Moores is in charge, it was a car crash waiting to happen. We didn't really fall out, it just didn't quite connect. It's been hard, it's been horrible, and it's been hurtful and disappointing. Our careers are only so short, so you've got to make hay while the sun shines. What a way to go to number one in the world. Those text messages, that hurt me. There's something about Kevin, there really is. Kevin was hung, drawn and quartered over a mythological allegation. 
I don't think he should have played for England again. What a shot that is to go to 100. It's his third 100 in succession in test matches in England. Having won the Ashes in his first test series, Peterson had become a permanent fixture in the England team. It's all he needs to get the three figures. Simply sensational to watch, Kevin Peterson. Peterson, the boy from Durban, had shown us glimpses of his genius. He was now about to show the cricketing world things they had never seen before. That's a shot. That is from Peterson. That is remarkable. Peterson at his best. What a shot from Kevin Peterson. Another wow moment is the switch hit. I mean, the MCC of virtually had to change the laws of the game because of this lad from Pete Marisburg is suddenly <laughs> deciding that he's going to turn round left-handed and hit it what will become cow corner for six. Explain. I was just doing what I felt was natural and what I felt would be a run scoring opportunity. A ball has landed in a certain area, I've turned around and whacked him another way because it feels normal. It didn't feel like I was doing anything out of the ordinary because I practiced it and repetition trains the brain. Well, well, what next? Went all the way. When I saw him playing Murley, I just thought this guy's a genius. It was the game awareness about where the gaps in the field were and having the array of shots and the confidence to play it against the best bowlers in the world. And I think that was what made KP stand out. The better the bowler, the more engaged he was in the battle and the more determined he was to take the game to them. Do you think we, as commentators, as people who watch you, should be a bit more lenient towards you? You know, we applaud you when you do that and you get labelled dumb slog millionaire. No, but that was a proper slog. <laughs> but there were occasions. There was Suleiman Ben in Jamaica. Hi, somebody calls, Ramden calls, Peterson is walking, taken! Arisa Edge Baston. Catch it, catch it, catch it! Catch it is the cry! He's gone! There was a sweep shot at um, Cardiff from Cardiff. Way outside off. Well, that's interesting, and that is just what Australia wants, just what England do not. It did frustrate, but the last thing you want from KP is to try and clip his wings and become just like the rest of us. You know, he had something different, and you had to give him some wriggle room to be able to play his way. And if you weren't prepared to do that, then you're not going to get the most out of him. I would always back him to, to attack. Um, it's probably the comments afterwards that that's what warranted a team up. That's the way it is. That's the way I play. I scored a lot of runs off the sweep today. And especially wound up Gucci as a Japan coach. Just think, but you're world class. You don't do that all the time. I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to the new England Test and One Day International captain, Kevin Peterson. I just see this as a wonderful opportunity to grab it with both hands and to, uh, and to go with it and run with it. What sort of captain do you think you made and do you think it came to you a little bit too early? <laughs> Simple. I never understood failure because I hadn't failed. I never understood families because I didn't have a family. I didn't understand being homesick because I'd never been homesick. Those three things are so vital to being able to deal with every single player in your team. I didn't understand a bloke suffering from bad form. So how am I going to go and relate to a bloke who's struggling? The hardest thing for him, and I'm sure he would admit this himself, you know, he was quite self-absorbed and self-focused. I think he just got frustrated that people couldn't do what he wanted them to do. Right, Kev, there's a lot of pictures of captains of South Africa that have gone to this school. There is one Kevin Peterson there. When you were playing here all those years ago, if someone had said to you, a picture would be up on the wall in the changing rooms as a captain of England, yeah. what would you have said? Just to play at Lords, play at the SCG, play at all those amazing grounds is something that I would never, ever have dreamed of. So to see that up there is actually quite nice. Do you know why you're in red? Captain in England. So <laughs> would you prefer it not to be in red? It doesn't bother me. Like I've said, as a youngster, my goal is to become a cricketer. I know you're trying to trick me into <laughs> saying I would love to, to have been for South Africa, <laughs> but like I'll say to you again, I'm very well versed on what I'm supposed to say and what I'm supposed to not say. Um, I've achieved everything that I could possibly have wanted to achieve in the game of cricket. The only thing I never won was a 50-over World Cup.
Was I a good captain? Should I have been given the captaincy? Absolutely not. But I was the only one playing all three forms of the game. What did you make of him as a captain? <laughs> Wasn't that good at captaincy, was he? <laughs> I think Kevin was a good lieutenant, but not a good captain. There's a way of getting your message across and cajoling people into doing things. That wasn't really Kev. Kev was overbearing and sort of, you do this, you do that. The fact that Peter Moores was in charge and they were polar opposites. It was a car crash waiting to happen. Most people find Peter Moores a thoroughly decent He's guy. Nice Would guy. you agree with yes. that? But you describe him as the woodpecker in the dressing room. What do yeah. you mean by that? Somebody who came and just kept pecking your head, train, do this this, that. And when you're in the international in environment, you need to take pressure away from players, not put pressure onto players. He put pressure onto players, senior players, challenging them. Clearly ask questions, say, are you doing this? But understand what has made me successful and understand what will continue to make me successful. I was still a young coach. I, these areas I look and I pushed at this, you think, well, actually, you should have taken some more time. So I don't look at my relationship with Kev as something that deteriorate over time, we didn't really fall out, it just didn't quite connect. Kevin Peterson and Peter Moore's tenure as England captain and coach lasted barely five months. It's been hard, it's been horrible, and it's been hurtful and disappointing. It did come too early to him, but I think there was other things in his life at that time. It was blatant, the IPL was huge, and I don't blame him for that. In the one day tour of India where there was the terrorist attack, and we were all stuffed in a hotel room, talking about whether we were going to come back or not, and Kevin, as captain, says, I'm desperate for us to come back. I just want us to win a game. And it might have been me, it might be someone else said, Kev, you want to come back because you've got an IPL auction coming up. He went, that is not it whatsoever, absolutely not. And it was so transparently false that everyone in the room could see through it. New coach and captain Andy Flower and Andrew Strauss now face the unprecedented task of managing a centrally contracted player who wanted time away from England to play for big money in India. Let's be honest, you were fine until the IPL came. You know, it was what you wanted, it was where you wanted to be. Yeah, all the best players in the world were having opportunities to go there for a period of time and going to, and, uh, yeah, fill their, fill their wallets. And our careers are only so short, so you've got to make hay while the sun shines. IPL made a massive difference. While KP was making his way through the, the county game, it was all about playing for England. That was the pinnacle of the game. And then the IPL came along, and I think it just played very much into KP's natural inclinations, glitz, glamour, incredible kind of adulation for the, the players that did well over there. Obviously, a pretty big pay packet as well, which you, know, you wouldn't begrudge anyone being quite enticed by. Despite the distractions, this England team was on the way up and they started by winning their first ICC World Tournament. That will do nicely. England have won the World 2020 Men's Final. Peterson was named Man of the Tournament and carried his form into the English summer during a 4-0 Test Series battering of India. What a shot that is. That really is as good as it gets. That's a hundred, Kevin Peterson, that didn't take long. All great teams need great players, and Kevin Peterson is certainly one of them. Yes, yeah! yeah, gone this time. What a way to go to number one in the world. They've batted better, they've bowled better, they've fielded better. They have been by far the better team. We had Strauss and Cook and Bell yeah. and Trot. Yeah. That was a good line-up to play in, wasn't it? Perfect it was, for your game oh, as it well. Was, it was amazing. I mean, batting with Bell and batting with Collingwood, um, and then also batting with Cookie. It was incredible because our games suited each other. It was an amazing lineup to play in. A lot of people uh, misconstrued sort of the, the dressing room and think he was hated and this and that. Everyone wanted a happy Kevin Peterson in the team who was just going out there and batting. Talent wise, I don't think there's many better players who've ever played for England. Um, belief, that was the biggest thing he had. Oh, and he's hit that one hard. England remained at number one throughout the winter and Peterson was playing some of the best cricket of his career. Huge roars here, massive moment for Kevin Peterson, extraordinary innings from an extraordinary player. But when South Africa arrived in the summer of 2012 as the number two ranked test team, 
things began to unravel. Towards the back end of my time as captain, it was increasingly obvious to me that KP wasn't enjoying his cricket playing for England. In my mind, I could see him making a decision where I'm going to become one of these T20 specialists. I'm sick and tired of English cricket. I don't like the way I'm being treated in this environment. I could see a big falling out happening and I could see him leaving English cricket for good. What about loyalty? You know, Natal, they can't do it for me, I'm moving on. Knox, they can't no, do no, it for no, me, no. I'm moving on. Yeah, but England, there's an IPL, I want to move on. What about a bit of loyalty? No, no. I'm incredibly loyal to Natal. I've come back to play for Natal on numerous occasions. I never wanted to move on from England. I want my schedule monitored because I was the only player in the England setup playing 2020s, test cricket, one day internationals, and had a very lucrative contract in the IPL. They do it now. They look after every single person's schedule. I was playing the most number of days of cricket in international cricket apart from MS Dhoni at the time. I said, just manage my workload. That's all I wanted, NASA. I didn't want to move on from England. Are you crazy? After a triple century from Hashim Amla, England went 1-0 down at the Oval. Oh, no! Up goes the finger, the end of Jimmy Anderson. And what a performance from Graham Smith and his men. But it wasn't the opposition that was hurting Peterson the most. One thing that you found very difficult to take was the fake Twitter account yeah. going around, KP mm. Genius. Genius. Why can you tell that? Why did that hurt you so room. much? It was players in the dressing room associated to it. That really annoyed me. Why didn't uh, you challenge the guys? I was distraught, Nasser. I just went completely insular. I completely went right into my bubble. I was like, I was gone. That parody account was brutal. Now, the parody account was coming from people inside that dressing room started off as a bit of fun, became very nasty, very personal. Kevin took that to heart, he took it personally, he was very upset by it. It was funny because it was so close to the bone. Kevin loved that. I remember in the dressing room at the Oval laughing his head off and this is brilliant. Well, I'm the only one with an account. But do you not see, however much Kevin puts on this big ego, everyone will feel insecure. Do you not yeah, see absolutely. that there is a problem of a parody account? Oh, no, yeah, I do agree. But if you turn around and said, look, lads, if anyone knows anything about this, I'm not happy with it. It would have stopped, I'm sure. But like I say, I had nothing to do with it. It was a mate of Broaders, but he was convinced that it was people within the team. It's probably not a great thing for people to be reading those sort of things out in the dressing room and for you to be taking the out of one of your teammates. But at the same time, welcome to a cricket dressing room. You know, that sort of stuff happens all the time. Should Strauss and Flower have done more to stop it? Yeah, maybe. Social media at that time was a new tool, it was a new burgeoning thing, no one really understood it. My regret, and I've thought about this a lot since it all unfolded, you know, I had a good relationship with KP. I, I think when some of his other friends started leaving the team for whatever reason, I, I think I could have kept close to him and actually I, I became more distant from him. You know, I think he got quite isolated as a result of that potentially and, you know, that was in my power to, to alter that. And it led to one of the great innings I've seen in one of your worst weeks as a cricketer, Leeds. Headingley, Leeds Test Match. Mm. How can you play like that when you're in such a bad space? Game on. There's another. I was just watching that ball and I was playing against South Africa. And I was just like, you know what, this could be my final ever innings. That's short, that's gone. It was brilliant. It was unbelievable to watch. He had something to prove that day. Whatever you think about me as a player, I can still do things that no one else in this team can do. You've got to give him credit. Pretty much any time he needed to turn it on, he turned it on throughout his career. Dale Stone walked off the field that day and said, wow, he's angry. <laughs> Maybe England should have just had him angry more often. That is magnificent. Graham would come up to me and say, listen, I need you to bowl four overs here as quickly as you can, maybe five overs, you know, give me all you've got, we need a wicket. Where's that gone? He's ticking here, Kevin Peterson. After one and a half overs, Graham came running up from slip and he said, what's your plan? I think I'd gone for almost 20, you know, so Kevin had recognised that I was a threat and the way to, to, to counter that was to actually take me on. 
and he got rid of me in two overs. I was, that was it. I was out of the attack and he continued to, to swat everybody else around. So um, he was that kind of player. Tucks it away on the leg side. What a player, what a hundred. There's been a lot of talk about Kevin Peterson off the field this summer. He's let his back do the talking here at Headingley. There's something about Kevin, there really is. Where will you be with your cricket in a year's time? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Did you underline your importance, though, to the side, and did you underline it to the public in games like this, big games? <laughs> it's a tough question. You felt a little bit bullied by that Twitter account. Mm. James Taylor has written recently that that test match, he found you very difficult to take. You were his hero growing up, mm. and yet there was a bit of bullying from you towards him in that test match, where you blatantly made it crystal clear that you didn't rate him and he shouldn't be near the test team. What led into that test match, Nasser, was that Owen Morgan was the next cab off the rank. He should have played that test match. England picked James Taylor, who I thought couldn't play. And that week for me was then just an absolute disaster. I had to bat with the guy who the guys were just laughing at while I was batting. The week goes from bad to worse with Texgate. Well, didn't go, didn't go great. <laughs> <laughs> but How do you get into a position the... where you are texting the opposition players or because direct messaging him? No, texting, because yeah. they're my mates, Nasser. Andrew Strauss had said to us, under no circumstance will you go and talk to these guys. I'm going, shut up, you idiot. When Mornay Walker runs into bowl to me, I'm going to try and whack him as far as I can whack him because he's a buddy of mine. And that personal thing is I don't want him at the end of the match to go, KP, <laughs> how are you going there, buddy? I want to know that I've absolutely belted him. But off the field, I don't need anybody to tell me that I can't speak to people. He was being a d He was. I think there's this impression there that, you know, I was always telling KP to not speak to the opposition, and that's something that I don't think I'd ever do to KP. He did that whoever we played against. He always had his friends in the opposition. So those text messages, that hurt me. That hurt me, and, and certainly, you know, the stuff around how to get me out, I just I just don't see how you can do that personally. You know, I think if you're, you're playing for a team and potentially you're helping the opposition get one over one of your own players, I'd, no. I don't think he should have played for England again. And I said it at the time. You know, if he was proven guilty to have sent the opposing team those text messages, he shouldn't have played again. The big question in Textgate with Strauss was did Kevin Peterson give the South Africans advice on how to get Strauss out? It's plausibility. He said it was banter, it was a conversation, which is right, it was banter, and it was a conversation. And did he give advice to a South African bowler? Did he tell Mornay Morkel to go round the wicket? No. So he's right about that too. But if Mornay Morkel said, do you reckon I should go round the wicket to him? He said, yeah, good idea. I felt that Kevin was hung, drawn and quartered over a mythological allegation which was that, yeah, he might have been abusing Strauss to his mates in the other team, and that's unsavoury and unacceptable, but he wasn't giving tactical advice, and it was that which was used as the real stick to beat him with. I tell you what, there were three South Africans who were having conversations with him, and they were absolutely gobsmacked. They, the word inappropriate was used on a number of occasions. They were really surprised, really surprised. <laughs> Peterson was dropped for the final test of the series at Lords, a match England had to win to stop South Africa replacing them as the number one test team in the world. Edged, there it is! South Africa have won. They've won this match, they've won the series, and they go to the top of the world rankings. Some would argue that South Africa I'm, played... I'm a thousand percent sure, they, they played a very clever hand. They threw the charm offensive at their players chatting away in Afrikaans to him in the middle, making him feel friendly at home. Isn't winning more important than all this team nonsense about this, we've all got to be friends and mates? <laughs> Win the game. Don't worry about being matey and friendly. It's short term, long term. Anyone can make an exception to a principle on a one-off occasion that might help you, but what damage does it cause long term? I still laugh when they talk, talk about the text messages I sent the South Africans calling Strauss a d I wonder how many messages were floating around between Giles Clark, Andy Flower. Those guys are on the same side. You're texting the South African team sure. about your captain. One is people on the same side, hopefully, yeah. trying to get the best out of Kevin Peterson. 
hopefully. The other, that was a good word, hopefully. The, the other <laughs> is unacceptable. I made a mistake. I made a mistake. I've talked about it. I said to Strassi, I'm, I'm so sorry. So there's not much more that I can do on the situational or on the topic. We've got to move on. English cricket's got to move on. That doesn't mean that when you come up with a circumstance where the principles you stand for as a captain or, or that the team stands for are um, undermined in any way, that you don't stand up for that. In fact, if you don't stand up for it then, why have those principles in the first place? I'd just like to take this opportunity to apologise to my teammates, all England supporters and the ECB for the situation that has arisen over the last couple of months. But thankfully we have drawn a line under it and it's time to move forward. For all his brilliance, Peterson's England career had now taken a dramatic turn for the worse. His antics had driven a huge wedge between himself and the England team. And with an ashes down under fast approaching, something had to give. I know Kevin, he does hold a grudge. He was bad for the team at that point, we got rid of him. Who won from the Kevin Peterson debacle? Everybody lost. A lot of people are still very raw and, and wounded about the whole thing. Don't treat every single person the same. From Moores through to Taylor, Strauss, Pryor, Flower. Where does it end? At some stage you, you not think, it could be me, Kev. The whole team are just fragmented, I'll be honest. The team seemed to have been shot to pieces. The amount of briefing from inside the England camp about Kevin Peterson was pathetic. Why does Kevin have to be best mates with his teammates? I know Kevin. He does hold a grudge. He was bad for the team at that point. We got rid of him. Guys were crying in the dressing room because of the abuse they were taking from the bowlers. Who won from the Kevin Peterson debacle? Everybody lost. A lot of people are still very raw and, and wounded about the whole thing. Playing cricket for England is the pinnacle of any cricketer's career, and I want an opportunity to do that again as soon as possible. Up and over. What a way to get to 100. What a talent he is. Having been successfully reintegrated into the England team following the Texgate scandal and now playing under new captain Alistair Cook, Peterson helped England retain the Ashes with a 3-0 victory on home soil. Hi folks, my name's Kevin Peterson. You better believe it. But in a year which saw back-to-back -back Ashes, England arrived in Australia three months later and things went horribly wrong. Let's get on to the final chapter, Australia. Before we talk about you, the individual, it was also the final chapter for that team, that, that yeah. era. Yeah. Did you see that coming as a team? Or was that, you know, you turn up at the Gabatoire and Mitchell Johnson's bowling like that and you go, oh, wow, we're in trouble here? No, I didn't see that coming as a team. What I saw coming as a team was we weren't wanting to engage in change. It needed to be Flower's way and, and that's the only way. I wouldn't say it was the most welcoming of environments. Quite tough if you were the new guy coming in. If you weren't part of the playing 11, you know, you were referred to as the bench. You know, the bench can clean up the bottles, the bench can do, you know, you, you kind of felt there was a, yeah, like a massive division between the guys who weren't playing and the guys that were playing, which disappointed me. You didn't rate Flower as a coach. Why? I thought he was a mood hoover. <laughs> That's what I thought what he was. What do you mean by that? He's the kind of bloke that came in the room and immediately the mood would just go. Just the way that he engaged with me from the start, he just completely lost me. He didn't think I cared. He challenged me on so many different things, which I just thought, dude, I don't need you in my life. Cricket's a team game made up of individuals. Don't treat every single person the same. Cricket is a curious game. It is a game of individuals. You can't get away from that. But obviously there's a team framework that you need to buy into. I would say on the spectrum, it's more a game of individuals than say rugby or football. And matches are won by great performances from great players. So you need great players in any team. But of course, that 
balance of bringing the two together is always where the issues lie. To this day, yeah. has anyone ever told you what specifically you did wrong no. on that Ashes tour? What do you think you did Apparently wrong? Apparently I played really bad shot in Melbourne. <laughs> It was an outrageous slog from Peterson. And I whistled, I don't remember whistling. Whistling thing's an odd one, isn't it? Because Very odd. if you're dropped as an England cricketer for whistling in the dressing room, sounds a bit odd. Mm. If you're 3-0 down in an Ashes series and the captain is trying to give him an up and out and speech and there's pressure on everyone, and your best cricketer that everyone's looking at in the dressing room is stood in the corner whistling away. Was I? That would wind me up a little bit. Whistling, I thought, was when I walked off the field. I... That's what I thought. Maybe I was staring out, I just team Staring meeting. out of windows. Possibly. Like I mean, are you going to really cross if some, one of your teammates is just staring around because you know that he can't freaking stand a team meeting and you're talking about top of off and all that garbage? I don't think he would, Ness. You as captain, if I'd sat in the back of that room whistling while you are doing a team meeting, it wouldn't have got in the press because I wouldn't have left the room. You'd, you'd have knocked me head off. So when you've got the supposedly best player in the team doing that, an act of absolute defiance towards the captain. That alone would be enough for me to say, right, that's it for you, pal. I would react very toughly, very hard, like a proper leader should. I wouldn't tolerate it, but I wouldn't want to lose my best player. I wouldn't self-harm. I wouldn't commit cricket suicide. The issue at that stage was that you had a senior player who had got disconnected from the team. Paul Downton said that he saw a player in Peterson that was disengaged with the team. Did you see that from the commentary box? I just saw a team that had disintegrated more than any other England team that I'd seen. 5-0 and an utter disintegration. Everybody starts to look for reasons why. I don't believe it was just Kevin Peterson who was disengaged. The whole team had just fragmented, I'll be honest. Um, I think it, the, the, the team seemed to have been shot to pieces, I think, from that. I think the first innings of the first Test match, Mitchell Johnson, Ryan Harris were outstanding in that series, I thought. You know, I just felt that it was almost, right, this is the perfect chance to blame Kev, you know, because he's been a bit of a prat. I was on that tour as a broadcaster, and the amount of briefing around the back in the press room from inside the England camp about Kevin Peterson was pathetic. It was pathetic. It was like, just focus on playing, play better. Can't be blaming one person. Why was I disengaged? What had led up for three, four, five years before that? Don't you think that a strong leader or a strong coach would have been able to say, you know what? What's been happening in this dressing room is <laughs> Do you think Duncan Fletcher would have allowed that to happen? Duncan Fletcher was England's greatest coach. Flower won three ashes. Flower Australia won. Australia was rubbish. Flower won the only ICC world he Australia went, was rubbish. Won. Flower won in India. Was he coach when you won in India? He won, yeah. He had amazing players. Flower took players. you to number one side in the world. He had amazing players, Ness. He had Cook on fire, Strauss on fire, Trot on fire, I was on fire, Bell was on fire, Pryor was on fire, Anderson, Broad, Swan on fire. I mean, you name it, they were on fire. Kevin Peterson won't have it that Andy Flower was an exceptional coach. Given the fact what Andy Flower achieved as coach, do you not see that as remarkable? No, I don't, because I know Kevin. And he, he does hold a grudge, and he does, when he decides to destroy someone, he, he goes for the full cavalry approach. Um, Andy Flower is and was an exceptional coach. When we won in 2010, he was lauded as a genius for you know, being that very pernickety, everything needs to be absolutely spot on. When we lost, it was, oh, well, he's too interesting in detail. He had a very, very exceptional way of communicating with people, very clear ideas and philosophies on the game of cricket. To say Andy wasn't a great coach would be a long way off the mark. There's so many players that played under him who love playing under him, who still go up back and ask him for advice to this day. That just doesn't happen if you're not an exceptional coach. England went to number one in the world rankings. They looked a proper unit. How much you give credit to the coach, how much you give credit to the captain, how much you give credit to the fine players that are under their command, that's difficult to, to analyse. But if you're going to blame coaches when things go wrong, you have to give them some credit when you see a team perform as England did in that period. The other thing that's really winding you up yeah. is what you feel is the bullying culture 
amongst those bowlers yeah. that when a fielder misfeels, certain people get a volley of abuse. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I said to Jimmy Anderson once in a test match, I said, the only thing that I'm really scared of is passing the ball back to you from at mid-off. I said, because if it goes below your knee or drops on the floor, you just give me that look and you just stare at me. Should I have ever been in a position to say that to one of my bowlers? If you dropped a catch and you're getting yelled at by bowlers, it wasn't a great display to the opposition, more importantly. I remember after we played the Adelaide test match where we, we got hammered, Graham Swan had quite a bit to say about, you know, the batters having to pull their finger out and all this stuff. And I think even Graham Gooch had to kindly remind him that, you know, well, mate, you're capable of scoring test rounds too, mate. Why don't you pull yours up? You've been in dressing rooms. Batters, bowlers, that's the oldest divide in any cricket team. And it's always, it's never bullying. It's never an actual split in a team. It's, it's cajoling. It's, you know, I've got my boots on again. I'm only just taking them off. What's wrong with you lot? That's what it was in the dressing room. That team was, had a brilliant team spirit. Guys were crying in the dressing room because of the abuse they were taking from the bowlers. Crying, well, you think a guy should cry in a dressing room? You're playing for your country. Do you think I should hate playing for your country that much? Some guys didn't want to get selected for England because of what Broad, Anderson, Pryor, Swan were like. How would you respond to that? Uh, fiction. Um, if anyone thought that me, Jimmy, Matt Pryor were bullies, they're in the wrong sport. They shouldn't be playing sport. We were not bullies. You completely fell out with Pryor on that trip. Why? He was dropped and he was just the most negative person around that, those dressing rooms. He was talking about finishing his career, he was talking about how much he was hating it. And when somebody's completely bombarding negativity in and around, then I'm out, Ness, and I've got no interest. Matt was the team leader. He was the guy who kept everything together. I mean, Matt did everything. He reached out to Kevin way more than anyone else did. He was Flower's little go-to man, little spokesman, who would go back and tell Flower everything that was happening in the dressing room. I think Matt Pryor felt it was his role to basically pull Kevin up when he was when he when he was when he stepped out of line. It wasn't just Kevin, that was Matt's job. If he saw someone he thought was drifting from the team, not being part of a cohesive unit, he would go to me, go to the hotel room, phone them up, go for a coffee, whatever, talk to them. That's what he'd do with Kev. I certainly wouldn't do that with Kev. I'd, you know, wash my hands with after the texting thing with Strauss, I just thought if he's batting and scoring runs, fine, but I'm not <laughs> eating or drinking with him. But Matt would go out of his way. It came to a head after the Melbourne Test match. Yeah. There was a team meeting called. Who spoke the most at that team meeting? Pryor, bloke who had just been dropped, who was in the worst space ever known to man, and every single person would tell you that. I mean, he said, excuse my French here, <laughs> flower, this is our team. Mm. Do you agree with that? Did he say that? Yeah, but I think I, we then all engaged in this, what you've just said, and then everything that happened in the meeting went to flower. Actually, that is what happened. Do you think yeah, you because I got quizzed about it in Sydney the next two days later. I got hammered about it in his room two days later. Was there anything in your um, persona that looked ahead a little bit? There are people who play the game. Mm. Kevin. Yeah, I never losing, played the game. We're yeah. losing the Ashes. Mm. We're going to lose the Ashes 5-0. Yeah. They're going to look for a scapegoat. I'm already in trouble. Most of this team don't like me. The coach doesn't like me. Keep your head down and just hope to be there for the next test match. By taking them but, on, but, you gave them the option but Nass, to But I you. thought that I was actually... I, I took flour on in his room, 100%, but I was helping Cookie. Not only had England been hammered 5-0 down under, the tour also saw Jonathan Trott take a break from cricket due to mental health reasons, while Graham Swan retired from the game altogether. It's time for someone else to strap themselves in and enjoy the ride like I have done. In the aftermath, Peterson was dropped from the side. He would never play for England again. Would you have axed Peterson after the Ashes? No. I'd have axed him after he'd text the opposing team. We were robbed by Kevin Peterson sacking from the England team of at least five, possibly seven years of the best batsman I have seen for England in my lifetime. I also resented the fact that he had been scapegoated for an appalling tour down under, which frankly was a failure right across the board by the whole team, and there was no explanation given. Isn't it just a classic case of when you're playing well, your team are like that, and when Mitchell Johnson's coming in and rolling you, the team starts yeah. to disintegrate? That's what happens with sport. 
It's exactly what happens with sport, but the best coaches and the best man managers are able to make sure that it doesn't go as pear-shaped as it did. It is the job of the captain and coach to manage difficult people, and particularly when um, the difficult person might be a great player or a match-winning player. But there may be a point where you have to say enough is enough, and clearly they felt that was reached. Why does Kevin have to be best mates with his teammates? Does he have to be? He was a top scorer on that trip. Yeah, but he wasn't Kevin Peterson averaging 60, 70 on that trip. So you drop the best player because he didn't get as many runs as you wanted him to get, but you keep someone who's not as good as him because he's a nice bloke in the dressing room. That's the weirdest selection policy I've ever seen. I think people forget that he was on a final warning after Techscape. I think he was a bit of a waning talent as well. He'd had a few injuries. He had to come home from New Zealand in 13. I just think it was possible to, to be really disappointed and sad that this was the end after watching such a rare talent, but also thinking England had hit rock bottom. Do you know what? This is, this is the best thing to do. And, and I think that point got forgotten in some of the hysteria afterwards, a lot of which was generated by Piers Morgan. All the supposed crimes thrown at Kevin Peterson are things which should be easily dealt with by a confident, strong leader in a, in a good environment. And I think the England dressing room lost control of itself because it wasn't led properly. It's obviously still very raw because... Not really. <laughs> well, not for you. Oh, for me, But yeah. for some others, you know, Matt doesn't want to talk about it. Jimmy Anderson, Stuart Broad, obviously Cookie, Andy Flower. There's still people who are very hurt about what happened and what's been written since. Yeah, Cookie especially. I mean, he, he... He got his friends in the media to try and destroy Cookie, who, as you know, is one of the most gracious, modest, humble blokes I've ever met in my life. And how Cookie reacted to it is phenomenal, I think. He didn't bite back. He didn't get into a stupid PR war with him. He just said, no, the story is how it is. You know, he was bad for the team at that point. We got rid of him. Do you think that Piers Morgan was a help or a hindrance to Kevin Peterson? I think he was a massive hindrance. I felt that a lot of people would have had a lot more sympathy for, for Kevin if this guy didn't, didn't sort of barge his way in. And, and, and he was the one who was, who was doing the bullying, if anybody. Do you feel at times you may have gone too far, you know, calling the England captain a rep... Right back, he didn't get into a stupid PR war with him. He just said, no, the story is how it is. You know, he was bad for the team at that point. We got rid of him. Do you think that Piers Morgan was a help or a hindrance to Kevin Peterson? I think he was a massive hindrance. I felt that a lot of people would have had a lot more sympathy for, for Kevin if this guy didn't, didn't sort of barge his way in. And, and, and he was the one who was, who was doing the bullying, if anybody. Do you feel at times you may have gone too far, you know, calling the England captain a repulsive little weasel? Mm. His wife ends up in tears, etc. Do you understand the power of what you and Kevin do in that sort of situation? Yes, and it was emotional and over the top, and I probably used language that was a little bit too inflammatory. Certainly didn't want to upset Mrs Cook, I don't know her, but I heard that and I, that didn't make me feel good. However, I would argue that Alistair Cook, in the meeting in which Kevin Peterson was sacked from England, behaved like a cowardly weasel. He didn't address a single word to his player. He let Paul Downton do all the talking. It was all over in five minutes. He stared at the ground for most of it, apparently. I'm sorry, that's not the way a proper captain should behave. Actually, I think that the Twitter campaign, which I waged, backfired. I think it had the opposite effect to what I desired. I think if I had my time again, I would have been more moderate about it because I think it got people's backs up. What was your relationship like with Alistair Cook? And what's it been like since? Well, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And I was there to help Cookie. And I was helping Cookie. It was absolutely fantastic. I think I can say that there are regrets about it. I don't think the decision was wrong, but obviously the fallout and how it, it wasn't great for English cricket. Alistair Cook said when he retired recently that he felt that that period was handled badly. It was a very hard one to manage correctly. I don't think it was managed correctly. I don't think it was deliberately, but I, I do think Alistair bore the brunt of it. Um, and that was unfair on him. As England captain, you, you are involved in decisions, but you, you're not fundamentally, you don't make those decisions. Those decisions about who, who get picked for the team, who's got central contract, all that stuff, are made above your head. So I did feel a little bit of a scapegoat there. Do you not see a, a pattern developing here in the, you know, right from your initial schoolboy coach 
who you didn't rate as a coach, through to yeah. Natal and fighting the system there, through to Knotts, through to Galleon, through to Moores, through to Taylor, Strauss, Pryor, Flower. Where does it end? But you, but you, At some but you, stage you not think, it could be me, Kev. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, 100%. We're all different, Nasser. We're all completely different. I'm not going to be friends with everybody. Everybody's not going to be friends with, with me. And it's just a case of accepting, understanding, and just moving on. But I wanted to move in a direction where I needed to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Um, and it rubbed people up the wrong way. It did what it did. The whole thing's been very messy. It hasn't been English cricket's greatest time. You know, there are a lot of people that are, are still very raw and, and wounded about the whole thing. Kevin being one of them. And there are other people that perhaps haven't been so public also feel very wounded and raw as well. Who won from the Kevin Peterson debacle? Everybody lost. Kevin lost five years of his England career. Alistair Cook lost because the team got worse and affected him. England cricket fans, I think, were cheated out of their best, most flamboyant player. It was a lose-lose for everybody. Kevin Peterson and English cricket reached the end of the road together. Certainly when I came in, bearing in mind he'd been out of the team for 18 months, I felt it was a step back, and my job as director of cricket was to take English cricket forward. It came down fundamentally to what became a lack of trust. You know, KP didn't trust a lot of people at the ECB, probably didn't trust some of his teammates. Some of his teammates probably didn't trust him. That's not a rich environment to play a team sport in. It was a sad, but perhaps predictable end to the career of one of England's greatest ever cricketers. A new life in the South African bush beckons, and in typical KP fashion, he isn't doing things by halves. You go through everything that we've achieved in English cricket, and Peterson is right at the forefront. I'm a team player. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that, to be honest. I think he'll be remembered as a slightly divisive character that fell out with people, but by God, could he play the game of cricket? Two weeks ago, I walked into two rhino that had just been killed. It's ridiculous what he's gone and done, and now he's trying to change the world on wildlife. You only got two options. Yeah. Kevin Peterson. 100 odd test matches, 8,000 test match runs, ruffled a few feathers, annoyed a few people, or Kevin Peterson played another three or four years like you could have done, got your head down, didn't upset people, and have a longer career. You go through everything that we've achieved in English cricket, and Peterson is right at the forefront. I'm a team player. <laughs> First time I've ever heard that, to be honest. I think he'll be remembered as a slightly divisive character that fell out with people, but by God, could he play the game of cricket? You're right under pressure, aren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he could have got 40, 50, 100s. He was that good. He could have averaged 75, 80. Captain England now raking Kevin Peterson's bunker. <laughs> How many players now trying to play like Kevin Peterson? All of them. Beautiful shot. In 2014, and with nearly 14,000 runs to his name, Peterson's international career came to an acrimonious end. Love him or loathe him, there's no doubt he has left his mark on English cricket. There's something about Kevin, there really is. 23 test match hundreds. What would you have as your best hundred that you played for England? The best hundred from a mental perspective and from a physical perspective was my 150 I got in Sri Lanka against uh, Sri Lanka in Colombo. Well, an extraordinary shot. Call it what you will. It's another boundary to Kevin Peterson. I sweat profusely. I mean, I'm just a sweater, unlike Cookie, who doesn't sweat. And I'd toured Sri Lanka before, and I think 40 was my top score, and I always thought to myself, I said, there's no way in this world you could score more than 40. And we went on that tour, and I just thought, if I'm going to get runs here, I'm going to have to slog 100. And I went through nine pairs of gloves, five shirts, and a session and a half, and got 150. Just anything that was anywhere near, giving it a full, a full kitchen sink. 
massive moment for Kevin Peters. An extraordinary innings from an extraordinary player. I think the 100 that I got against South Africa in the first test match as captain was something that I, I treasure. First match as captain, and he gets a century. Everything is so sweet at the moment. The 100 against Australia, that 158 at the over, was probably the most famous of all the 100. That's it. The arms are aloft. Four through extra cover signals Kevin Peterson's first Test 100. What a performance. England had not won the Ashes for 19, 20 years, so the Oval, I think, for what it meant to English cricket, having not won the Ashes for so long, yeah, that's right up there. This could yet be the biggest day of his career. That lad you first met in South Africa, did you think then he would end up the cricketer he is now? No, absolutely no chance. But the driven self-belief, knowing what he wants out of life, he goes and gets it. It's ridiculous what he's gone and done. And now he's trying to change the world on wildlife and poaching. Would it surprise me if he becomes a huge world figure in conservation? No, it wouldn't surprise me at all because that's what he wants. He believes he can be the man who's responsible for stopping killing of animals. Will he be able to do it? Kevin Peterson won't stop until the world knows what he's trying to do. These days, KP splits his time between England and South Africa, where he has become heavily involved in conservation, raising money and awareness for endangered animals, especially the rhino. It's something you should be pretty proud of, you are, dear. I, I, you know what? You know, you've copped just... a lot of stick over the years, let's yeah. put it that way, yeah. but not for this. This is something that people give you a lot of credit for, and rightly. When you actually get up close and personal to the animal and you see the devastation as to what dead bodies and you smell the smell and you walk in and you see where, I mean, two weeks ago I walked into two rhino that had just been killed. Bullets through, they chopped the head off. I mean, the smell. Oh, I, I, it, it is something that just sticks with you. When you see that, it's emotional. There's just an attachment to it, and that's why these events that we hold where I get all my influential friends and all the guys with all the cash in the world to come in, because these cars can make a difference. They make big decisions, they can create awareness, and I want them to have that emotional, spiritual sort of effect with, with nature and with the bush. And, and we're making big strides, like huge strides to stopping this. Let's get the elephant here. One person we haven't spoken much about is Jess. Yeah. How important has she been in everything that's gone on in your life? Unbelievable. I think it helped so much that she was a lot more famous at the time that we met. They had achieved so much, so she understands the travel, she understands the media, she understands the role that you play when you're in the public eye. But she's been nothing short of incredible. And then the mum that she is, I mean, I could not ask for anything better. We live a very private life. We're incredibly private people. We don't go and post any images all over social media of our family. We just don't do it. It's a decision you have to make. Am I gonna sell my soul? Or are we gonna be a private family where we can escape to anywhere in the world and no one can ever point a finger at us if I want my privacy respected? And that's the decision we've taken as a family. How will he be remembered, Kevin Peterson? I think he'll be remembered as um, an entertainer, as a player of great flair, very dynamic, somebody who perhaps changed the face of, of test cricket within England for a while. But also with that will come the way that it ended, which was very sour. You know, that great team that went to number one in the world fell apart amidst great recriminations. So that will be part of the legacy as well. At his peak, he was sensational. He was a superstar. I mean, he even managed to knock the London Olympics off the back page during 2012, when the whole Texgate thing exploded. And you have to be a special talent for that time, but even if it was a negative story. You go through everything that we've achieved and everything that we talk about generally in English cricket, and Peterson is right at the forefront. 
So as much as he is a, a difficult character, as much as a, well, he's a prat at times. 50-50, I'd say. 50% of the time he's a fantastic, 50% of the time he's a prat. But I'd buy into that because I know he's going to win me games. You came out with a great line on commentary. Hi, folks, my name's Kevin Peterson. And you better believe it. Does that really sum him up? Yeah, it, I think when he walked out, he almost gave you the, the right, it's my turn now, pay attention. It's the announcing, it, it's me now. These have been in, yeah, that, that's all right, but now I'm going to go to town. I'll remember him as the guy who's played most of the memorable innings that I was involved in with an English cricket team. You know, I, some of the things he did on the pitch were without peer completely. And I think that's the way he'll be remembered, actually. You know, I think he'll be remembered as a slightly divisive character that fell out with people, but by God, could he play the game of cricket? Well, what does KP do nowadays to keep his competitive juices flowing? Well, he's a member here at the Leopard Creek Golf Club, one of the great golf courses in the world, typical KP. And he's playing this week in the Alfred Dunhill Pro-Am with some other big names. Okay, how are you hitting them? OK, Nass, actually. What do you play off? Up left six. Is it like you're batting? Are you uh, right to left, everything goes leg side? Or... Uh, it's like my batting. If there's, a green, if, there's, game? if there's a green to attack, I go for the green. <laughs> <laughs> I don't lay up, Ness. <laughs> I don't lay up at all. Ernie, first things first, what do you think of Peterson, the golfer? You know, since he's... Uh... Retirement. He's better. I mean, he's got more time on his hands for his golf game. The thing with you cricket guys, you know, you got that uh, in-out motion, you know, hitting it through the covers, and we go the other way in golf. What about now? Do people of South Africa look at him and are very proud of what he's done? What he's doing now is incredible, you know, with his conservation, with the rhino stuff. Whenever you give something back to your home country, people uh, warm to you again, and they've really done that in a big way. We're in play. What's your chipping skills like? I'm going to tell you in about a second. You're right under pressure, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Birdie Putt is going ahead of Grace here. He's got no golf etiquette at all. Brendan Grace is the pro. He should be going here. Peterson beats Peterson. I'll go first. Birdie, birdie, birdie. Surely can't miss this. Oh, oh. Yes. Mm. I just love that. I'm a team player. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that, to be honest. <laughs> Some would argue that Peterson could have been and should have been even better. Oh, he definitely could have been better. Well, his, his record could have been better, 100%, because... You know, he had people eating out the palm of his hand and he'd give it away often. But I think Kevin was very tuned in to proving himself. I don't think he was necessarily as tuned in to being the best player in the world as Coley or someone like that. So it was more about, I'm going to demonstrate to whoever it might be, this bowler who thinks he's good, this captain who thinks he's good, this team who think they're good, I can do this and I'm better than you. A special day for him, a presentation just now of, his, of a special cap to mark that 100th test match. You know, he's averaged 47 in test cricket, over 100 tests, 40 in one-day cricket, just under 40 in T20 cricket. And the Jeffrey boy cuts us, oh, yeah, but if you just dug in. But what happens if he'd have tried to dig in at the start and his technique, because his technique wasn't great. You know, he didn't have an ultimately pure technique, but he had great mind, great hands. Could he have averaged 55? Yes, possibly. But if he'd have tried to bat that way, he may have averaged 40. You know, an average of 47, but it's more the manner of the way that he played and scored those 8,000 test runs, because I don't remember many of them being boring. He's got hold of that all right. Where's that one gone? Alistair Cook got knighted the services to cricket. Alistair Cook has been eulogised as the greatest batsman of his generation. Alistair Cook's test match average 
is lower than Kevin Peterson's. So yeah, I'm sure Kevin could have done better. Didn't do badly. He could have got 40, 50 hundreds. He was that good. He could have averaged 75, 80. Too much energy went into trying to usurp the power base of the captain and the coach and the things he didn't like and that he didn't need to worry about. Just score hundreds, Kev. Don't be a Hit that spot right behind it, like an inch, and just hit that as hard as you can. Well done. Well done. Come back, come back, come well back, come back. Hey, come back. Oh, right. Yes, I think you should, Nessa. Thank you. After a shot like that, all right, kid. No, 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 this is the highlight of my career. <laughs> Captain England now raking Kevin Peterson's bunker. Brilliant. <laughs> you feel privileged doing things like this, or do you take it for granted now? I always feel privileged because it's not my sport. And you walking out to play golf with Els, with Gracie here, all these guys, it's like somebody to come into that with Lords with us. And does it make all those sacrifices that you made all those years ago, all the hard work, the professionalism, the moving away from here, does it make it feel all worthwhile? Because the lifestyle you have now mm. is wonderful, isn't it? I just try and be happy because I was so unhappy for a few years. All I want to do is try and be happy and stay happy. When you played cricket, yeah. you used to have a go at the golfers, didn't you? What are you going off and playing golf for? Golf's yeah. the most boring game in the world. <laughs> What's changed? They call it the golf bug, and I've got the golf bug. Is it a way of keeping your competitive juices Massively. playing this? After a career in cricket, yeah. Yeah. how competitive do you get on the golf course? I get competitive with myself, but I understand and know that I'm never going to make money out of the game. I'm going to have fun with my mates, and so I don't take it too seriously. Is that you having to chip over a bunker, by the way? <laughs> Let's see if you've shot. got it in you, Peterson. Impossible shot. Impossible. Oh, my word. Ness, can you get my putter, please? I want me. I've just, just raked a bunker for you. <laughs> Boys, come and have a look at this. This is why this place is just so special. Check the hippos out. They're out the water. Have a look at the size of that crocodile there. Crikey. Look at the size of that thing. <laughs> you get that on the Chelmsford golf course. That's what I get, to be honest. Bit of croc, bit of hippo. I mean, it's just such a special place. How right. beautiful. More importantly, can you hold a putt for birdie? Let's see. Hey! Hey! Oh that is that. how you play, but... <laughs> <laughs> that disappoints me immensely. <laughs> this is a very disappointing result. <laughs> what do you think South Africans think of Kevin Peterson, the person, the player, now? He doesn't encounter animosity, that's for sure. Um, that's all gone. I mean, there's respect for his cricketing ability. There's still, in South Africa, a, a good deal of scepticism about the man, the person. He is Kevin Peterson, the English cricketer, and always will be in South Africa. Half of them would say they don't like him, and the other half would say we've been entertained by him, and he's a damn fine cricketer. Doesn't that sum up the man? Doesn't he polarise yes. opinion more yes. than any other cricketer there's been? Absolutely. I'd loved him to remain in South Africa, and if he could have delivered those performances, Batting with the likes of A.B. de Villiers. I mean, can you imagine having de Villiers and Peterson coming in in the middle order? My goodness, I would have loved that. Where do you rate Kevin Peterson? Number one. He's the best England player that I've seen. I always describe Marcus Druskovic as the best Englishman I've ever played with. But Peterson's the best player I've ever played with for England. I thought he was a genius. I loved him. The best. Best I had the pleasure of being 22 yards away from. Top. How many players now trying to play like Kevin Peterson? All of them. You cannot compare to a Gooch or a Cook, guys who go out at the top against guys who bat four or five in the middle with very different roles, very different tasks. But if you want to compare KP with the middle order dashers that I've seen for England over the last 30 years, as good as any of them.
It's going to be my final question. Okay. You only got two options. Yeah. Kevin Peterson, 100 odd test matches, 8,000 test match runs, ruffled a few feathers, annoyed a few people, wound up a few people, fell out with a lot of people, mm. but played the way he did with the odd dumb slog millionaire shot in yeah. there. Or Kevin Peterson played another three or four years like you could have done, played the game, got your head down, didn't upset people, and have a lot longer career. Can we say a mixture of the two and played for a couple years longer? <laughs> I think you're right. Your personality made you the cricketer you were. I think my personality did. Four Ashes wins. And a World Cup, or that World Cup. And what were you in that World Cup? Player of the tournament? Yeah. Player of the tournament. And so... my son was, more importantly, my son was born in the middle of that tournament and I was able to hop back to London and go and see him. You were very watchable, KP. <laughs> Thanks, Naz. In 2005, at this famous old cricket ground, Kevin Peterson played arguably his and England's most important ever innings. The brash boy from Peter Maritzburg went on to become one of the most talented and watchable sportsmen ever to represent England. No matter what side of the KP debate you are on, there can be no doubting that Kevin Peterson, the batsman, was an absolute genius. That's a great shot. Some extraordinary innings from an extraordinary player. Coming. Brilliant batting. It's gone miles, miles and miles into the stand. What a shot from Kevin Peterson. He is the danger man. An extraordinary shot. Shades of Vivian Richards here. That is magnificent. 